Thank you very much, Jeremy, and thank you all for being here. And uh, what a day to talk about Trump and Australia. <laughs> for those of you who aren't familiar with the last few hours, the Prime Minister continues to argue that the deal struck between his government and the uh, outgoing Obama administration on refugees uh, is a done deal. But the President, however, begs to differ, taking to Twitter just two hours ago, calling it a dumb deal. <laughs> and uh, this follows a Washington Post exclusive story today uh, that shows that uh, Donald Trump um, was very upset with D Malcolm Turnbull during their 25-minute phone call conversation on Sunday. And among other things, Donald Trump uh, says that, uh, that uh, Malcolm Turnbull and this deal might mean a new Boston bomber in America, uh, that it might mean, among other things, um, uh, severing of the ties, perhaps. And uh, it doesn't quite go that far, but he clearly, in his language, made it clear that um, he would hang up after 25 minutes. And I'm reliably informed that the reason why Donald Trump was in such a bad mood is that he was told uh, that Malcolm Turnbull is one of those liberals. <laughs> <clears throat> Speaking of liberals, uh, quick time out. I want to congratulate the Centre for Independent Studies. Last year was 40 years, uh, Australia's leading liberal think tank. Uh, 1976 it was created, a special year 76. Little known fact, it was the bicentennial of Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, arguably the greatest document of political freedom. It was also the bicentennial of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, uh, the greatest document for economic freedom. And of course, in 1976 was the year that the great free market economist Milton Friedman won the Nobel Prize for Economics. So the fact that the CIS was established in that special year uh, tells you something about freedom. It really resonates. Jeremy mentioned that I'm going to wipe egg off my face, and that's always never pleasant. But I think it's always important that journalists and academics always be held to account. And the reality is uh, virtually all of us, not all, Ross was one of the few exceptions, but most of us were wrong about the Donald. Why was this the case? Well, I think the general consensus right from the outset, if you go back to June, July, when the Donald launched his presidential bid, the consensus was that he was rude, crude, lewd, a bit of a buffoon, uh, who, to put it mildly and politely, was incapable of understatement, um, <laughs> erratic, divisive, he lacked a core governing philosophy, and the general consensus was this would unite the Democrats behind a very flawed candidate in Hillary Clinton. It would alienate those important independents in the political center. It would upset the Hispanic community, the fast growing demographic group. It would alienate women, especially college educated Republican women. And moreover, it would divide and splinter the Republican party and the conservative movement more broadly. This was the overwhelming consensus to which I subscribed. But you have to remember, the party of Reagan was very reluctant to embrace Donald Trump for various reasons. I mean, the party of Reagan over the last 40 years has been about reducing the size and the scope of the federal government, free trade, immigration, and activist engaged foreign policy. Trump is none of those things. In many respects, Trump represents an insurgency populist movement against many of the core tenets of Reaganism. I'll never forget in late 2015, National Review, Ronald Reagan's favourite magazine, many of you are no doubt familiar with it, uh, edited for a long time by William F. Buckley Jr., the patron saint of American conservatives. It dedicated a special issue, Stop Trump. Extraordinary. You had about 30 to 40 of the finest conservative and neoconservative minds in the United States writing articles on why Trump should not be the GOP candidate. Add to this the electoral arithmetic, uh, demography. Hillary Clinton, for all her flaws, was nevertheless the most experienced political figure, uh, arguably in living memory, perhaps other than George H.W. Bush. Add to this all of those factors, 
And you can see why the betting markets, the pollsters, the experts, the so-called experts predicted a Hillary Clinton win. We were wrong. Why? Well, I think the best explanation, this is probably one of the few times that people like us can ever praise the fellow, but Michael Moore, the left-wing movie documentary maker, I thought had it best in the months leading up to last November's election. He said that Trump was resonating with a lot of working class folks, uh, uneducated mainly, from Rust Belt states, deindustrialized towns, from states like Wisconsin, uh, Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania. Many of these states hadn't voted Republican since the Reagan era. And Trump, according to Michael Moore, was resonating these folks because he stood up to globalization and Wall Street and the big corporate banks. And he railed against identity and political correctness that had poisoned the Democratic Party. And although a lot of these folks didn't particularly like Trump, they nevertheless saw him as a human version of a Molotov cocktail that they could throw into the system in Washington and smash the system. And the reality is, although Donald Trump lost the, elect lost the popular vote by nearly 3 million votes, he won pretty convincingly in the Electoral College votes, which is what counts in the American system. And he won over those so-called Brexit states that Michael Moore identified. I think another reason why people like me were horribly wrong about Donald Trump, and I say this about academics and journalists especially, is that we all too often live in a bubble. I think that um, it's very easy for us to float around and not even mix with a Donald Trump supporter or a Marine Le Pen supporter or even a Nigel Farage supporter or a Pauline Hanson supporter. Uh, this is certainly the case with a lot of my colleagues at university and in journalism. I'll never forget the day of the election, uh, spending the day at Channel 7 and then going to the ABC that night and seeing all my colleagues in radio and television staying away from sharp objects. <laughs> and I said, you guys have to be dispassionate about this. You've got to report it as it is. But of course, a lot of these journalists just could not come to grips with the fact that a Donald Trump resonated with so many people who are fed up with globalisation, or at least blame globalisation. I think they're more likely to be right to blame technology, but they're blaming globalisation for displaced uh, jobs and wage stagnation and income inequality. They're blaming political correctness. They're blaming open borders. Um, and I think all too often journalists and academics, folks you often watch on television, we do live in a bubble. And the episode reminded me of something that Pauline Kael the New Yorker film critic, something she said after Richard Nixon's landslide election victory in 1972. He beat George McGovern 49 out of 50 states. He won 61, 60% of the vote. Pauline Kael, a quintessential metropolitan sophisticate from Manhattan, she looked at her colleagues the next day and said, how could this be? I don't know anyone who voted for Richard Nixon. <laughs> Finally, um, I think it's worth just concluding before we go to the next panel. Can a Donald Trump-like figure resonate in Australia? I'd say a few points. One, I think Donald Trump himself is peculiarly an American phenomenon, and we can talk about this in Q&A. I think America, the broad cross-section of the American people, are in a foul mood. 60 to 70 per cent of the American people, according to all the available polling evidence, think that the country is heading in the wrong direction and these polls precede President Obama. So they go back to the Iraq war or 2004, 2005. But I do think that he's clearly, or Trumpism, if you like, has resonated in many parts of Europe, uh, especially in France. And we'll know in a few months time whether the Trump-like figure Marine Le Pen wins. And it's conceivable she could win. But whether a Trump-like figure in Australia resonates I have my doubts uh, on two reasons, for two reasons. One, unlike the United States and Europe, uh, we've had 25 years of continuous economic growth. We haven't had a recession in a quarter of a century. We've had real wage growth throughout much of that period. It's tapering off now. But there's been, all things considered, a robust economy for that 25-year period. 
You haven't had that in Europe and you haven't had that in America. So that's one point. Second point, as controversial as our border protection policies are, I would argue they help boost public confidence in a large scale non-discriminatory immigration system. And that confidence is obviously lacking in many parts of Europe and indeed in the United States. And so sluggish economy and poor immigration controls, I would argue, are the two principal reasons why we've seen the proliferation of a Trump and Trump-like movements across Europe and America. I'm doubtful that it could happen here. Although, if our economy does go into recession and if we somehow lose control of our borders, and moreover, if political correctness continues to uh, foul the academies and the broader culture generally, circumstances could change. Thank you.